Earlier this year, I commissioned Delight to do an external review of patient flow in University Hospital Limerick. There were three specific objectives for this review. One, to define and describe patient flow challenges within the ED and UHL. Two, to determine opportunities to improve the flow of patients. And three, reflect on the effectiveness and impact of current patient flow practices. This review provides an independent and comprehensive overview of patient flow within our hospital group. On Thursday the 29th of September, I briefed staff on the findings of this report and a recording of the webinar follows this intro. Thank you for those who were able to attend and for your excellent questions. This external review is now published and available to view on our website, ulh.ie. Thank you. Good afternoon everybody and thanks very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Elaine Connolly, I'm the Communications Director for the Hospital Group and this afternoon we've, um, we've asked you to join us to, um, so that we can share with you the outputs of the patient flow review that was done recently by Deloitte. We're just going to ask the panel here to introduce themselves. Uh, Noreen Salan, Chief Operations Officer, UN Hospitals Group. Brian Lenehan, Chief Clinical Director, UN Hospitals Group. And um, Colette Cowan, CEO, UN Hospitals Group. Um, the format for this afternoon is um, the CEO will present the findings and the recommendations from the Deloitte report, and then we have an open Q&A session. Um, and just to let you know that the um, facility to submit questions is now open, so you can do that throughout the presentation, and then we'll get to them at the end. Okay, hand over to Thank you. Thank you. So we share the slides now. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you for your, taking the time to listen to this webinar. And as the Director of Comms has said, it will be shared um, with all the staff uh, throughout uh, the next few hours. Um, just to talk about the, the patient flow review and the context around why we um, had uh, a review done, we we were very uh, aware of the activity levels in the hospital and how busy the hospital group is as an executive management team. And in March. Of, of this year, we decided we'd get an external review done just to ensure that we all the initiatives we've put in place are working and indeed, is there any improvements we could make? And today I share that Deloitte uh, report with you and the patient flow review that was commissioned by myself. So in the first slide, you will see that we actually have the highest ED attendances in the country in 2021, that's 76,500. And increasing demand for unscheduled care with a 7% in ED attendances from 2019 to 2022. Indeed, during the pandemic, our ED remained busy uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, despite numbers dropping in other EDs in Ireland. We have the lowest number of open beds per thousand population compared to proposed health regions. And we have the lowest consultant SHD nursing and health and social care professional staffing levels across all hospital groups. Um, 100 to 175% lower than across staff categories, despite the fact that we have hired significant numbers of staff, um, over 900 staff in the last uh, 24 months into services. We also have the lowest private hospital base in the country, and as you know, old unsuitable infrastructure with 199 of UL hospital UHL's beds on Nightingale wards, which do not fit with the requirements under SARI guidelines. So just to talk a bit about uh, the project and what I tasked the external team to do, and it was broken into three phases from March to September 2022. Phase one was just data analysis and discovery, looking at activity and all of our data, which we shared with the external company. And phase two then was pathway mapping and review, but most importantly, it was the consultation process with 61 different stakeholder groups across ULHG and the Midwest Community Healthcare speaking uh, on their views on the pathway mapping and review. And then phase three, of course, is the final report, which I've accepted as commissioner of the report. And it looked at pre-admission, post-admission, integrated community and hospital services, how we can use our information to support sustainable performance improvement, and of course, leadership, governance and culture. This uh, slide, I think, is very effective and uh, you can study it yourselves in time, but it just again to look the number of attendances projected this year to our emergency department 
uh, stands at 79,644, and that's just based on our current pro rata numbers. We also have seen a 6% reduction in GP referrals to the emergency department, and we know that we need 302 additional inpatient beds to meet the demand at UHL by 2036. We currently have a 105% occupancy rate, which all of the staff are well familiar with, with the day's work that you do each day. And 6% of our discharges occur before 11 a.m. If we break down the 302 beds, 202 of them would be additional inpatient beds that we need by 2036 to meet the demand. And 100 of them would be placement beds to reduce the multi-occupancy wards, which we know already are the source of most of our outbreaks and infection prevention control concerns. But you can study that slide uh, and ask questions on it after if you wish, and we're happy to answer. So the key findings of the report is why we're here today and to talk to you about it and what we, some of it we know already and then there's some new things, but we are seeing a continuing trend of growing demand for emergency care uh, in UHL. ED intense attendances, as I said, increased by 7%. We also had an increase in attendances at our local injury units and medical assessment units at uh, Nina, Ennis and St. John's. Over 33,000 people attended their local injury units last year. We are also aware of our COVID-19 streaming pathways from ED, which has really changed significantly access for patients and our acute care pathways, which we're reviewing at the moment. And um, we have a high admission rate from the MAU leading to an increase in overall admission rates and demand for beds. We also have a combination of increasing demand and increasing admissions, which has definitely resulted in the addi additional pressures on inpatient be beds that you feel uh, throughout each day um, in the service. Other findings uh, of the report are that there are a high number of admissions and poor capacity means patients are often spread a lot across a large number of wards leading to safari rounds. Staff have uh, said that many, many times. We have a staffing shortage in particular in health and social care professional disciplines. We have no occupational therapist or medical social work staffing funded uh, for numerous wards that needs addressing. Elective activity has reduced by 4% between 2019 and 2021, which is a symptom again of our overcrowded emergency admissions our department and admissions. And the uh, finding also was that robust technology could play a key role in increasing efficiency and streamlining patient uh, flow. And we are too dependent currently on the paper system. Other findings, I specifically asked the team to review governance and leadership and the governance uh, of the hospital group by the executive management team, led by myself, reporting to the acute hospitals. And uh, there was an uh, indication that the governance is strong from the EMT, and our, we have operational group, as you know, as to what exactly is happening across our group. The clinical directorate structure provides clear reporting lines for clinical services, and it's the model we operate um, in the hospital system for reporting. They are also operationally accountable for. Uh, the work that goes on at both UHL and our other sites. Our group strategic plan, which is ending this year, translates very clear statements of vision and values to a robust strategy. And a lot of you have used that strategic plan in your business cases and pitching for lots of uh, developments, which have occurred incidentally as well in the last few years. And many stakeholders are proud of you, uh, University Hospital, UL Hospitals Group, and are proud of the quality of the clinical care they provide, and that's coming from the consultation process. And our quality and patient safety department, which has developed uh, considerably over the past uh, two years, but requires more um, staffing to help us to deal with quality improvement, uh, is also noted in the findings. Under uh, leadership and governance, just the recommendations then from the findings that we are working on is a recommendation around a head of services to run University Hospital Limerick. And that is uh, in place in an interim role. And we've interviewed for that post last week, with a permanent post starting very shortly. The clinical directors have spoke about additional capacity to allow them to do their job as clinical directors so that it can be strengthened with formalized associate clinical director roles. And of course, admin support to allow them to do both their management and their clinical roles. And we're going to scope that out um, as part of that recommendation. Clarification on directorate reporting and escalation requirements. What we found during the pandemic, and quite rightly, we all had to go into a command and control system, 
uh, and work very closely together to get through the couple of years of COVID-19. And we are now recasting and relooking. We spoke to the Executive Council yesterday around the re-empowerment of staff at uh, the directorate level and uh, cascaded down staff to take control of the site and of the work that happens there rather than an escalation process and um, straight to the command and control centre, which incidentally has been dissolved. Um, a targeted programme of staff engagement is required and that's in progress. And we'll be doing a lot of work on that over the winter period. Funding up for new quality and patient safety uh, staffing roles is part of a national bid that's gone into the estimates process. And then the development of a transformation office, uh, which is to be scoped. The transformation office would be around project management, quality improvement, because we have lots of different teams with lots of different advices on how we can improve process. But it's asking the same staff to do additional work. So we need transformation office to actually start working on some key uh, quality developments and improvements that will assist us to get through the next couple of years. Other recommendations then are that we should review our AMU and our ASAU referral process and our ED pathways should be conducted to align with national guidance. So as you know, we went from we went to COVID and non-COVID pathways for the protection of our staff and patients over the last few years. This now requires a full review so that we can get pathway access for patients uh, through the ED, MAU and ASU, and indeed access for GPs uh, to allow patients to get access in a, other means. And that work is in progress. ED staffing needs to be increased to manage the increased demand, particularly consultants and NCHDs. And funding for that is part of the winter plan bid, which will be launched next week. And that is to ensure that there's more persons on the ground seeing patients faster, turning around triage times, ensuring that treatment pathways start um, quicker. We're, we do understand it's difficult to recruit staff, but we still have to pitch for the funding to ensure that we have the correct staffing at, in the emergency department. Safer staffing for nursing is also part of that package, uh, and we're happy that that's progressing along. Another recommendation is to look at a, a range of ED avoidance measures, including consultant-assisted triage in the ED. The emergency department is exceptionally busy and is already busy in these last few weeks. And it's how we can ensure that there's other options for patients other than coming to our emergency department. And as I said earlier, the GP referral numbers have dropped, but the self referral numbers have not. And there has to be other options within the community healthcare operations regarding how we actually ensure that patients get care outside of the ED setting. We also need to look at the uh, documentation of those uh, avoidance pathways for NCHDs uh, to ensure that everybody that works in UL Hospitals Group is very clear on the priorities for this uh, end of this year and into next year so that we can work together and ensure that people are following the pathways and all of that works in progress as we speak. Uh, another area, of course, is improving OPD access and providing AMU access for GPs. Again, uh, GPs have no options uh, since we shut down a lot of our services during the pandemic um, for, for all the right reasons for safety. But they have no access other than through the emergency department at this time or some diagnostic services. So we do have to improve that access. Again, work in progress. Um, other recommendations then, pa patient flow of post-admission. So specialty cohorting on wards, increasing nursing involvement in ward rounds and care planning. And if we speak to staff, which we've done over many years, cohorting is an area that all staff support to have specialist wards, specialist nursing care is um, much improved. Mortality rates drop. It's, it's well documented in the research. We have a lot of progress done on what cohorting of wards look like, and we had to stall it because of the pandemic. And we're now reviewing that at the moment and ensuring that cohorting is, uh, can be returned. Uh, to most areas and to also to ensure that ward rounds are attended by uh, nursing, uh, senior nursing managers who are core to the decision making process for patient care. The implementation of criteria led discharge, we have floundered on this for common conditions for many years, and it's an area of core focus that if we can get criteria led discharge, we can actually free up the beds within the hospital and, in effect, take patients off trolleys in ED. And that is our core business. Streamlining of ward rounds, which reduce safari rounds, and increasing health and social care professionals at ward level. So their um, important professional input uh, is taken on board to help patients get home and not have to return. There's also renewed measures to redu reduce uh, delayed transfers of care, such as focus on discharge planning from admission and streamlined access. 
three events. All of this work is in progress. We also acknowledge again that additional staffing is required at ward level um, and bed management resources were put in in the last uh, couple of weeks as part of the winter bid so that we can divide the workload out across the UHL campus to ensure that our focus is on patient flow. And as mentioned already, 302 additional bed capacity is required up to 2036 uh, to deal with the health planning. Okay. From a community integrated community and hospital service, just some information on that the community health organization have been involved with us in this process. Uh, they have met with the external reviewers as well. And there are there's a lot of funding gone, on, gone into community healthcare organization, the development of community health networks. And they have lots of challenges in filling posts and ensuring that they can um, create access for primary care for patients who are um, seeking uh, access to the GP first and solutions to address this at national level are underway. And then to embed these community areas. So we are moving into regional health areas pretty quickly. We'll hear more about that in the first quarter of next year, but an integrated model is the only show in town now. And really we have a lot of work to do to ensure that we've integrated posts, that we ensure that patients can be treated um, in the community health sector before uh, they require emergency care in an acute model for an hospital. Um, using information to support sustainable performance improvement is key. If you ask staff yourselves, you all say the same electronic patient record is a must, order comes is a must, and we've been waiting, waiting on a national system to come up with a plan. But we really do need to upgrade the e-health systems across the hospital and the community to a fit for purpose single electronic patient record so patients can move freely um, both in and without the hospital. And we're scoping that at the moment and we'll pitch for that uh, pretty soon. Interim measures such as the implementation of order comms, as I mentioned, and the upgrading of our ICT infrastructure is being scoped presently because the cyber attack also taught us a lot of how infrastructure can go down very quickly um, and put demands on services. So, in effect, that is uh, a, an executive uh, view on the report that I had commissioned that we're all just studying at the moment and working on because it, we've only received it in recent days in its final state. But it's the most important report for you and Hospice Group and it is the most important for all staff to understand that it is your report as much as it, as it is the executive management team. And our focus will be on the recommendations and implementing the changes required to help people do better work and to help our patients of the Midwest. Thank you very much. I take questions with my team now. Thank you very much, Colette. Um, so, um, just um, to remind you that the Q and A option is open. If anybody wants to submit any questions, but I might start off with a, with the, a couple there, if that's okay. Um, to the the. In a bit more detail. Of course, yeah. Thank you, Lynn. So uh, you'll hear a lot of different bed numbers, but the core the core message is that we need three hundred and two beds by twenty thirty six. However, you would have heard myself and the chief clinical director in the health directors committee last week stating that we need eighty seven beds, and those eighty seven beds are the beds we need now this moment to just deal with the activity we have in the hospital. And if you work out the figures each day from Trolligar, you will see that we need those beds. Uh, to support the patients on trolleys and also to support elective work. So we know this already coming into the winter that we need 87 beds to manage uh, just this winter period. We have our new 96 bed block. We'll be turning the sod in it in, in October. That work will commence and it'll, call, it'll be a couple of years though and go some way to support the infrastructure that we have uh, required for many, many years now. Thanks. Um, uh, Professor Lennon, to the MAU and the um, stepping back the plans are on that. So we're, we're we're currently working with the medicine director and with the clinical um, director for medicine on the what we call the acute floor model, whereby the MAU and the SEU they're extensions of our scheduled care pathway. So I'd be very hopeful that our surgical assessment unit will start to function as an acute surgical assessment unit. Um, in the first half of October, 
and with the medical assessment unit, just delayed a week or two beyond that, because we don't want to flip both back at the same time, just to make sure that we do it on a phase basis. But I would anticipate we'll get back to a more normal surgical assessment unit and medical assessment unit function in the month of October. I'm just um, going to some of the questions. You mentioned one. Me. Do you want to just step in there, Elaine? I think they. Oh, yes, I'm reading, reading it. Um, can just checking now that you can be heard. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned that one of the recommendations is the implementation of criteria-led discharging for common conditions. What does this mean? It's a good question. Do you want to take it? That um, the the team, the clinical team, both nursing and the consultants and allied health professionals um, would agree. What criteria would need to be met for a patient to be discharged without necessarily needing a review on the morning of discharge? So, if if I take it back to orthopedics, my own speciality, if you're post-op of a hip replacement and if your wound is dry, you're mobilizing safely and physiotherapy are happy and nursing are happy that you have met all of the key metrics they need, that you could just be efficiently discharged without waiting for a registrar or a consultant or an SHO to come around and say, yes, so we would agree the criteria for discharge in advance of the common medical and surgical conditions, because they're the high volume conditions. So instead of having to say, can the patient go home? No, based on a checklist that the patient is fit to be discharged. Thank you. Um, just wondering then, um, what impact do you think the regional health areas will have on patient flow? Because there's been lots of talk in the media around the formation of those. And will that impact on some of the recommendations that are made here in this report? Okay, no, um, thank you. And another another good question, I must say. The regional health areas are, are evolving as we speak. And my view of regional health areas is very simple. It's what we need is one system and one budget. And that would streamline very much our work. So rather than the hospital having walls that it actually would open up a service that would include a uh, community uh, health organization and acute hospitals and indeed public health and other areas as well and that we would walk and work collectively as one in ensuring the patient pathway was the correct and right pathway and core to all of that is the pathways you would develop with the general practitioners with the clinical nurse specialists that have all moved into new roles there in the community and how we ensure that we do preventative medicine, preventative care, rather than all of our options being an emergency department. So we do know that Mr. Lean Woods, the National Director of Acute Hospitals, has now moved on to the implementation program regarding regional health areas. And there'll be a roadshow coming here very soon uh, to discuss the uh, regional health areas and indeed the evolution of them from quarter one next year, the early stages of the work we start. See you. Another question um, in here now, uh, what are the next steps to get support for the Deloitte report, which is very welcomed? Yeah, uh, very good. Uh, next steps, uh, very important is funding, of course. So um, people, uh, as you know, we go and we, we pitch for funding. We've been quite successful over the years in getting funding at many levels for many, many staff. And there's never an ill wind with a, a pandemic, even that a lot of funding came forward. However, it is a process. You have to go through the uh, winter plan bid. You have to go through government under the estimates process. The budget is just passed, so the letter of determination will issue in the next month. And out of that, we'll see what funding we've got for the National Service Plan. The Delight report is helpful in the sense that we've taken all of our data, we've consulted with staff, and we now know exactly what uh, we need. Whereas before we this, we knew what we needed, but we wanted it underpinned by clear data and analysis. That is now done. So this this um, report will be what we will use in all of our interactions with both national HC and government and indeed the regulators when they question us on various things. Okay. Um, just to remind everybody the Q&A is still open if you want to submit a question and we have another one in there. Will we see even more self-referrals to the ED if the extension of GP visit cards in the budget means people can't get a same-day appointment? That's uh, it's a very good question. Um, mm -hmm. And I know it is a concern 
both in the community and there would be some people in the acute sort of voices. I think what we need to do to counteract that fear is we really need to have a very strong communications piece over the next number of months with in, you know, hand in hand with our community partners and with general practice, educating patients on you know, who needs to attend the accident and emergency department, you know, who's more appropriately referred by their GP to an MAU or an SAU, the, the importance of the local injury units, the importance of GP out of our service, and indeed the services that can be availed through pharmacies. Um, general practice is under a lot of pressure, and there, there are, are a lot of talks at the national level to, you know, increasing the capacity and increasing the supports that are there, but it's, it's going to take a com combined response of all of those that are involved in healthcare in the region. Um, in relation to the recommendations, there's a lot of work that's already in progress. Um, so, what do you expect the impact of the report will be in the short term, particularly coming into the winter? Yeah, I think, um, as you know, we've recently had um, the HSE support team visit us, and I suppose a lot of um, what they have um, given us as follow on actions, and we worked very collaboratively with them around what our requirements were to try and uh, mitigate some of the risks uh, of, of overcrowding in the emergency department. So I think that, um, and actually Deloitte, a lot of what they picked up was very similar. So I think the work that we've already put in place around you know the long stay Tuesdays where we're concentrating very much on patients that are here for more than 14 days um, and they that particular cohort of patients then use a very high number of bed days um, and we have reduced that number working with our community colleagues also um, in you know from 138 at the beginning of July and it's now down to 118 and a lot of those patients have very complex care needs and many of those patients were delayed transfers of care because of their complex needs. Um, and the patients, you know, are now transferred successfully into their home or into their community or whatever is the most appropriate setting for them. So I think that a lot of the work that we're already doing um, will help us this winter um, and will help in terms of the report. And um, we've also put in an extra our new uh, patient flow or discharge coordinators um, on the wards as well. And they're much more visible and they'll support the wards. Um, because, as we know, the wards in, in UHL are very, very busy um, and it will help the staff there maybe to unblock um, some of the, um, you know, or move the patient along, I suppose, and use the red to green system more appropriately. Um, so patients need to have a scan or need to have something done on the day that the discharge coordinators can also help assist with that. So I think a lot of the work that we're already doing will really help with the, with the, with the implementation of the Deloitte report also. Okay. Thanks, um, Just in, in relation to all the recommendations that have been made um, by Deloitte, where do you think that we will see the biggest impact from those recommendations? I suppose uh, two things. One is the bed capacity, um, which I know we're not going to realise immediately, but it, it's great to see the 96 bed block is going to be starting in the next couple of weeks. Um, so, I mean, I think it does call out the need for both uh, new beds and also replacement beds for the 199 um, beds that we have in Nightingale wards. Um, also, then I think the resources that um, have, you know, they've identified, um, as the CEO said, we've identified that ourselves over the years and we have been building up on the resources. Um, as the CEO said, this year alone, we've had 900 new uh, staff start and we 1,200 last year. But it's still, we, our demand is still increasing and we still need um, a lot of uh, health and social care professionals we have safer staffing uh, on for nursing on a lot of the wards. We now need it in the emergency department. So I think that identifying those resources and us bidding for those resources nationally and building on what we already have, I think that will have a, a huge impact also. Thank you, Louis. Um, digital health and embracing technology is key to, to delivering a more efficient health service. How do you at Hospice Group plan to move forward in relation to an electronic healthcare record system for our patients? Yeah, and, and I totally agree. It's, it is absolutely key and we've been, been many years floundering around how we can get a system up and running. And we do have icons, as you, as you all know. But aside from that, the national view around an electronic patient record was 
to indeed test the model first in the children, new children's hospital. And that's why they've become, they're becoming a paperless hospital in time. It's a license agreement. It's an expensive resource to do. However, we do have a new director of e-health who I have asked to scope out what it would look like to have a digitized system across the region uh, with some, some core industries here locally to see can we actually get some scope to test different models to get an electronic patient record up and running. Okay. Um, can I ask then just in, in relation to the um, the winter, so what do you think our biggest risks are coming into this winter? How will the recommendations from the light help us? In the um, well, I'll answer first. I'm sure the Chief mm -hmm. Nurse Director will have a view on that as well. Um, but of course, our risks uh, is COVID. You know, it's still there. It is a risk that we just have to manage. Um, we're definitely, as a country, more in tune and vaccinated against it. But we also have a flu virus that is imminent. Uh, the flu vaccine campaign will start in the coming days. Really important that staff get the flu vaccine. The indications from Australia are already telling us that people are quite sick with the virus because, of course, we've been mask wearing for a couple of years uh, and now we have to deal with the new bugs. So that, that's the first thing. Um, our crowding is going to be uh, an area that will continue into the winter. We can see it already. We have seen a huge rise in uh, over 75s attending our emergency department. We've seen a, a very large increase in frailty uh, and how they're looked after and the demands are exceeding what we're able to manage at the moment, but there is a plan in place for it. So I'll hand you over to the Chief Clinic Director who might want to comment as well. I, I would agree both with um, COVID and the flu. I think our, our biggest challenge is going to be sustaining the response that we have stood up in recent weeks to our demand capacity mismatch. We've asked an awful lot of staff over the last two years, and a lot of our staff are, are tired, and we use words like burnt out and we use words like resilience. I think supporting our staff to continue the work that we have started to to us to be efficient with our early discharges, our transfers to our model twos, having good, well working ED avoidance measures, all of the pathways that we have, standing them up and getting our AMU, AMAU and our um, ASAU working. They're going to be the challenges and sustaining it through what will be a challenging winter. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I don't know if there's any final questions that people want to uh, to send in, but just to um, say that we'll be making this recording available to staff. So we'll be able to send you out a link to us uh, to all staff who weren't able to join us today and send that out tomorrow, along with slides from the presentation as well. Um, and uh, a link to the report, which is going to be published tomorrow. So if I leave it to the CEO for the final word, that's okay. Yes, no, thank you. Um, and just to say thank, to the, thank you to the people who joined the webinar. We fully respect people are busy as well with work schedules. So that I would encourage you to talk to your teams, your line structure about this report, to share the link with them, to share the presentation as well, so that everybody's familiar with the the journey we're all on now to try and really empower the Midwest and empower uh, UL Hospitals Group to get the funding they require to develop services. Uh, that is really important messaging that needs to be carried out by all of you. And it's our priorities. So when you're doing your priority list with your staff, these are our priorities that we have to work together on. And finally, just to thank you all. I know indeed it's been a difficult two years and that staff, what I would say to staff is that we have very little reserve left and all of us have to support each other now and try and work together to get to the first quarter of next year and come up with novel ideas how, of how we can do things better. And in the staff engagement, we are really, really interested in your views and that year the people really know uh, what the front line is like. And we would really, really appreciate if you could talk to us about that and we'd support novel ideas. Thank you.